good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Homer Neal, and I have uh, served as chair of the organizing committee for the Wiesner Symposium. Um, and we would like to welcome each of you to our symposium on strengthening the roles of universities in national science policy making, in education, research, and engagement. Uh, this is the latest in a series of symposia that began back in 1996. Uh, at that time, I was uh, Vice President for Research, and uh, Jim Dudestadt uh, was uh, President of the University. Our objective at the time was to engage in a collective effort to clarify the parameters and scope of the partnership amongst the federal government, industry, and the nation's universities and to optimize its future course with respect to the national good. Much has changed since 1996, but the mission of this symposium series remains the same. As government, industry, and academia have evolved over the years, along with the broader scientific, political, and economic climate, the need for dialogue has grown even stronger. This need and the opportunity are reflected in the title of our meeting today, which focuses in particular on what we as universities can do to inform and support national science policy. I want to acknowledge the Office of Research for sponsoring this symposium, and I uh, in particular really want to thank the members of the organizing committee for their hard work over the, over the last several months. It occurred to, to us that some of you may not be familiar uh, with how appropriate it is for us to name the symposium in honor of Jerome Wiesner. Uh, Jerry Wiesner was a Michigander through and through. He was born in, in Detroit and raised in nearby Durban. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from the uh, Department of Electrical Engineering here at the University of Michigan. But he spent most of his career at another fine school you may have heard of uh, that is also known for excellence in research, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. At MIT, he rose to the ranks of uh, professor, department head, dean, provost, and ultimately president. Along the way, he made his mark <coughs> beyond the quarters of MIT, uh, on the larger issues of science and education policy. In the, 19, <coughs> pardon me, in the 1950s, he served on two key national panels that advised President Eisenhower on issues of national defense. In 1961, he became the chair of the President's Science Advisory Committee. Uh, and that was under President Kennedy. In that role, he helped shape the national framework for the federal investment in research. Uh, and that, of course, has been very successful 
through today. Successful in spurring innovation and economic competitiveness in our society. He also contributed to the work that led to the first nuclear test ban treaty. Jerry passed away in 1994 at the age of 79, leaving a legacy as a great educator, researcher, leader, and statesman. Two years later, the first Wiesner Symposium was held here and entitled The Future of the Government University Partnerships. Uh, that event was sponsored by the Ford Motor Company, Motorola, and the National Science Foundation. Today's participants are no less distinguished and the topic at hand is a critical one. I expect we will have a very productive uh, time together today and tomorrow, and we will do so in the finest traditions of the Wiesner Symposium. To get the ball rolling, it's my pleasure to introduce the current uh, Interim Vice President for Research, Professor Jack who Jack is a Michigan person as well, having earned both his master's and PhD from the university. And he has led a distinguished career here as an educator, researcher, and administrator. He is now the J. Reed and Polly Anderson Professor of uh, Manufacturing Technology in the College of Engineering. As VP for Research, Dr. Hu has overall responsibility for nurturing the excellence and integrity of research across the entire campus. He oversees the UM Office of Research, which promotes interdisciplinary research, develops and implements research policy, provides central administrative services in support of faculty, uh, stimulates innovation and economic outreach, and manages activities related to compliance um, and the responsible conduct of research. So please join me in welcoming the Vice President. Good morning. Thank you, Homer. Good morning. Okay. Um, I want to welcome you all to the University of Michigan. Um, I think the weather will be much nicer later. Uh, I want to, in particular, offer special thanks and welcome to our keynote speakers, John Holdren, uh, Ralph Ciceran, Franz Cordova, and Rush Holt. Thank you for making the time in joining us for this particular event. We also have some friends who are here I would like to acknowledge. Um, I know Regent Shonda Ryder Dix registered for the event. I think she will join us later. Uh, Dr. Dix is a uh, dermatologist uh, who received her bachelor's degree and MD from the University of Michigan. So we're very pleased that she plans to spend some time here with us. Also joining us is Sidney Paul, uh, who is the Legislative Counsel for U.S. Senator Gary Peters uh, from Michigan. Uh, Senator Peters has shown that he truly understands the importance of federal R&D to our nation's competitiveness. We just had him speak uh, Wednesday morning in our Washington breakfast of the U of M Alumni Club. Uh, I also had a chance to meet with Sidney Wednesday uh, before Noon, so it was good seeing you twice in a week. Welcome. Of course, I would like to also welcome uh, Jim Duderstadt, um, who is President Emeritus. Uh, Jim participated in the original Wiesner Symposium in 1996. 
Also here, I think we have Cynthia Wilbanks, uh, who is um, Vice President for Government Relations. And we have a number of deans from the schools and colleges. Thanks, thank you for making the time attending this symposium. I also want to acknowledge um, two vice presidents from the CIC universities, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and Indiana University. Thanks for coming. I want to thank all the speakers, panelists, and every one of you for taking the time to join us for what promised to be a very important engaging discussions during the next two days. But I do want to thank Homer for taking the lead in organizing this event. So I would say it was around March, uh, April of last year, he and Vadu came to my office, uh, said, Jack, we have this idea, I want to continue the Wisner Symposium. Can we have some money from you? <laughs> so a short conversation, I was convinced right away, I think this is something definitely worth doing. So thank you for the leadership and also for uh, all the members of the organizing committee to assemble quite an impressive list of speakers for today and tomorrow. It's important to make it clear that Homer is the one that originally uh, created the idea of the Wisner Symposium, as you heard from him. Homer had a long and distinguished career at the University of Michigan as a physicist and a leader in higher education. He's currently the Samuel A. Goldsmith Distinguished University Professor of Physics and has served as vice president for research and also as interim president of the university. As vice president for research, Homer felt the need and the obligation to convene leaders from industry, government, and academia to discuss major issues of common concerns with an eye to work, working together for greater good of society. Today and tomorrow, we will explore the challenges and opportunities in science policy making and how universities can mobilize to play a larger role in national science policy through education, research, and convening power. More than that, I think we want to make sure that this meeting has an impact. Accordingly, we have set a goal to develop scientific specific recommendations and actions that will guide us to move forward. The recommendations, the report containing the recommendations does not have to be known, but the recommendations should be concrete and actionable. With the people we have gathered here today and tomorrow, I think we can achieve that goal. I look forward to working with all of you toward that end. We're fortunate to have our president, uh, Dr. Mark Schneisel, joining us to provide inspiration for our meetings. Mark joined the University of Michigan in July last year. He came to us from Brown University. He was serving where he was serving as provost. Before that, he served as Dean of Biological Sciences in the College of Letters and Science at UC Berkeley. Mark earned his bachelor's degree in bio chemical sciences from Princeton University and MD and PhD degrees from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has had a distinguished career as an educator, researcher, and academic leader. So please join me in welcoming President Mark Schleser. Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Jack, for that kind introduction. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming today and also extend my gratitude uh, this morning's special guests uh, and the organizers of the symposium. Uh, I appreciate everyone's willingness to engage in this important dialogue. The topic of the symposium is both timely and important. At the University of Michigan, we embrace our nearly 200-year history as a public institution with research for the public good deeply interconnected with our beliefs and our aspirations. We consider it both a privilege and an obligation to provide thoughtful insights and important contributions towards public policy and to help solve the most complex and challenging issues confronting our society. Our work to fulfill these ambitions is facing a multitude of challenges, and these challenges are not unique to Michigan. 
The modern research university must adapt to a quickly changing landscape and navigate obstacles such as rising costs, flat or negative growth in research support, and the need for increasingly expensive research infrastructure, just to name a few. Our focus today and tomorrow is on science, and even the science itself looks much different than it did when I began my career. To illustrate using my discipline, the biosciences have become a fundamental target of discovery in many fields once distant from biology. Engineers, chemists, physicists, computer scientists, mathematicians, and others are helping unravel the secrets of life and contributing to the development of treatments for disease. Social, environmental, and public health research is teasing apart the many and varied influences that have impacts on life science at levels that range from the biology of living cells to the quality of human life. As a physician scientist, I feel particularly strongly that we should grow our nation's shared investment in medical research. We need to take full advantage of our new understanding of the human genome and remarkable technological advances to pursue discovery in personalized, or now we call it precision medicine, that will improve health and the treatment of disease. Advances in other disciplines offer similar promise. The environment in which this work takes place is also very different. In the biosciences, there is a basic and systematic mismatch between supply and demand. As funding has grown more scarce, the number of researchers and trainees exceeds the amount of resources available to sustain both their careers and the bioscience research enterprise. At the same time, we're seeing greater international competition. This has led success rates to fall sharply for NIH grant applicants, and the system as we know it is no longer adequately supportive of the best science. I look forward to hearing the recommendations from this symposium because there is so much at stake. When the best science and public policy are well aligned, the results can be awe-inspiring. It was a university, this university in fact, that tested and proved the safety of the polio vaccine, or the many universities involved in the consortium that resulted in the mapping of the human genome, led by former Michigan faculty member, uh, as a leader now of the NIH, Francis Collins or the contributions of the Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech that blasted America to the forefront of space exploration. I remain confident that universities are the most ideally suited institutions to breach the new frontiers of human achievement and to address the problems we face as a society. One reason is that universities can convene the experts and practitioners to objectively inform public policy at the highest levels, just as we're doing today. Our objectivity is more important than ever as we live and work in a culture that is increasingly political and polarized, even when it comes to science. Universities are also in the best position to assemble multidisciplinary teams that can tackle the most pressing issues like poverty, healthcare, climate change, and many others. Fostering these types of collaborations are a major focus of my work here at the University of Michigan. Multidisciplinary collaborations are essential because the biggest issues we must confront as a society don't conveniently organize themselves into single disciplines. Problems don't know what department is supposed to study them. They're just problems. Multidisciplinary approaches are also more attractive in terms of the diversity of funding sources available, and they have the most potential to make the kind of impact we're striving to achieve. There is much at stake, and thankfully, we have such an impressive slate of panelists over the next two days to discuss this issue and other relevant issues. I look forward to hearing the recommendations from this symposium in the months ahead. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker. As the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, Dr. John Holdren has been called one of the most influential science advisors to the President of the United States in recent memory. His work has helped bring climate change, and the science of climate change to the forefront of American politics. The New York Times describes him as having had one of the most prominent careers in academia and policymaking of any scientist in the land. He was trained in aerospace engineering and theoretical plasma physics, earning his bachelor and master's degrees from MIT and his PhD from Stanford. Dr. Holdren is taught at UC Berkeley and Harvard and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, 
the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as a foreign member of the Royal Society of London. During the Clinton administration, he served on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. His awards include a, Martha, a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the John Hines Prize in Public Policy, the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, and the Volvo Environment Prize. Almost so many prizes, there's no time left for you to speak. Uh, friends and colleagues, please help me welcome OSTP Director, Dr. John Holdren. Well, thank you, President Schlissel, for that very kind uh, introduction. Well, it really is a pleasure to be back at the University of Michigan. Uh, I've had uh, the wonderful opportunity to be here on a number of previous occasions. Uh, I see a lot of uh, friends and colleagues in the audience. I'm going to tackle this broad topic of U.S. science and technology policy challenges, opportunities, and the role of academia. I don't speak from prepared text, I speak from wordy PowerPoints. And you're going to see a wordy PowerPoint. Some of it will go by rather quickly. I'm not going to read all the words on the PowerPoint uh, to this audience. You can read faster than I can talk. Uh, but I will post the PowerPoint uh, on the OSTP website, which is listed uh, at the end, so that you can catch up uh, with any details that you miss. Uh, this is uh, a particular pleasure for me because Jerry Wiesner was one of my most important mentors. I learned an enormous amount from him uh, about uh, not just uh, being uh, an academic, uh, but about being a science advisor to the President of the United States. Uh, and um, I, uh, I miss him uh, dearly to this day. I'm going to cover a lot of ground, uh, as outlined here, uh, roles and responsibilities uh, for science and technology policy in the government, uh, as mentioned in the title, the big challenges and opportunities before us, how the Obama administration has reacted to those, the role of the academic community in science, technology, and policy, and finally a few words about the leadership of this university in that domain. So let me start with federal government roles and responsibilities in this space. Uh, beginning with the role of science and technology in national well-being. As indicated here, and I won't read you this list, science and technology are central to meeting virtually the whole panoply of major challenges that we face in national and international policy. And of course, one should not leave out at the bottom of this slide the role of fundamental science, discovery, invention, expanded understanding in lifting the human spirit this inquiry into the nature of ourselves, our world, our universe, uh, is fundamental to what makes us human. The role of the federal government in science, technology, and public policy, of course, is manifold. Uh, funding R&D, of course, is important. The federal government pays for about 30% of all R&D, but for more than 50% of basic research. 55% of that basic research is performed in colleges and universities, and the federal government pays uh, for over 60% of that. But a second major role of the federal government is shaping the environment for science and technology and innovation more broadly, including the environment that influences how much other entities pay to uh, support science and technology. And those environment-shaping roles of the federal government include tax policy, intellectual property rights policy, regulatory policy, high skills immigration uh, policy, among others. And of course, another important way in which the federal government shapes that environment is its investments in science and technology relevant infrastructure, high-speed computing, broadband space assets, and more. Of course, another crucial role of the federal government is in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education, and workforce training. Now, of course, at the K through 12 level, STEM education is part of the overall education responsibilities that reside mainly in states and local school boards, but nonetheless, federal programs and incentives can play an important role there and do. Uh, further STEM education and training at the undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral levels are, as everyone in this room knows, strongly influenced by federal grants, programs, and policies. And in addition to that, the federal government can and does encourage and broker partnerships among colleges and universities, schools, and corporations to improve STEM education, worker training, and lifelong learning. 
So let me talk about policy for science and technology in the federal government. The responsibility for science and technology policy is shared between the Congress and the executive branch, obviously. Some key committees in Congress, House Science, Space and Technology, Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation, and of course, all of the relevant appropriations committees and subcommittees. There is a long history of bipartisan agreement and cooperation on many science and technology issues, although there have been exceptions, and certainly there are some exceptions in play today. We may hear more about some of those in the course of this symposium. The key executive branch science and technology actors uh, make up a long list uh, indicated here. A uh, large proportion of the cabinet uh, departments and uh, major agencies have science and technology responsibilities. Science and technology policy in the White House is centered in the office I have the privilege of directing, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. It sits in a set of other offices in the executive office of the president, colloquially known as the White House. Uh, the ones with which OSTP interacts most closely are shown in the crescent on this slide. There are some others with which we also interact uh, listed in the fine print uh, at the bottom. We have two major responsibilities, uh, and this divides the science, technology, and policy space into the twofold way uh, developed by another one of my mentors, the late great Harvey Brooks, namely that science and technology policy have these two facets, policy for science and technology and science and technology for policy. And you see indicated here, the functions under policy for science and technology include the budget functions, helping the president determine priorities and levels of funding for science and technology across the agencies, science and technology education and workforce issues, interagency science and technology initiatives, open government, scientific integrity. That's all in the domain of policy for science and technology. The other half, science and technology for policy, basically amounts to our responsibility for making sure that the president and his other senior advisors have the information from science and technology that is relevant to the decisions that they face across the whole policy space. As I often uh, used to tell my students, the scientific facts aren't everything, but they are usually something. And it is unwise to have policy made in ignorance of the relevant scientific and technological realities, even if those may not dominate the final choice, since there are many other considerations that the president also has to take into account. The specific responsibilities of my office also include providing oversight from the White House for the National Science Foundation and NASA, a variety of responsibilities related to national security and emergency preparedness communications, coordinating and overseeing U.S. cooperation in science and technology with other countries in cooperation with the State Department, chairing and managing the Interagency National Science and Technology Council, and providing administrative and analytical support for PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Say a few words about each of those. The National Science and Technology Council is made up of the deputy secretaries and agency administrators from all the federal departments and agencies that have science and technology responsibilities, and its job is to coordinate science and technology activities that cross those department and agency boundaries. Those include such major entities as the U.S. Global Change Research Program, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, Networking and Information Technology R&D Program, and the nation's STEM education strategy. PCAST is made up almost entirely of folks who keep their day jobs and advise the White House on a part-time basis. Currently 19 members, uh, <coughs> and uh, the only member who is a compensated government employee is, is me as the director of OSTP and the President's Science and Technology Advisor. But all the others are special government employees. They're presidential appointees. Uh, we have uh, one of them sitting in the front row, Dr. Rosina Bierbaum from this university, is uh, a member of PCAST. And its function is to provide an additional source of high caliber science and technology advice for the president and to help link OSTP and the president to the wider science and technology community. Uh, these are the members uh, of the Obama PCAST in the second term. 
uh, there'll be a test at the end to see whether you can match uh, these faces to their affiliations. They come from the academic sector, the private sector, the philanthropic sector, the civil society sector. So current challenges and opportunities. Let me uh, start with uh, what I regard as the toughest of the challenges. Sustaining and growing support for research and development under the existing constraints on the federal government. President Schlissel mentioned that challenge rather prominently in his own introductory remarks. Uh, advancing an adequate energy climate policy. Reconciling administration and congressional priorities for NASA with each other and with budget realities. And addressing systemic weaknesses in STEM education in this country. You could have a longer list, but these are the ones that I think are the toughest that we currently face. And then turning to the biggest opportunities. Harnessing the full potential of partnerships, partnerships of all kinds, local, state, and federal governments, partnerships across sectors, public, private, academic, civil society, international partnerships, the power of those partnerships for helping us address all of the foregoing challenges is immense, and it's an enormous opportunity. Creating and building businesses, jobs, economic growth, and societal well-being by facilitating the translation of discovery, including principally in university laboratories, translation of discovery into practical application in the marketplace or in other ways to meet societal needs. Huge opportunity for doing better at that. Exploiting recent advances in biomedical sciences and big data to drastically improve healthcare. Really huge opportunity. And applying current infotech and digital tech to improve the effectiveness and accessibility of government. Again, I could make a longer list of opportunities, but these, this is the subset that I think is most compelling. So let me turn to what the Obama administration has done in the science, technology, and policy domain in response to these challenges and opportunities and what the outlook is looking ahead. I start with the President's first inaugural speech, January 20th, 2009, in which he said, we will restore science to its rightful place in government. What did he do to meet that pledge? One of the things he did was in presidential appointments. Five Nobel laureates in science at the very beginning of the administration appointed to presidential positions. Another 25 plus members of the academies of science, engineering, and medicine in presidentially appointed positions. The first ever chief technology officer, chief information officer, and chief data scientist for the US government appointed by this president. No president has ever talked as much about science and technology and STEM education as this one. No president has ever held as many events in the White House to celebrate science, technology, and STEM education and achievement in those. Five White House science fairs, the most recently just a week ago today. Astronomy night for kids on the South Lawn. Uh, ceremonies in which the president meets, and he always finds time to meet with the uh, winners in the Intel science talent search, in the uh, <coughs> The, the U.S. Nobelists, the winners of the Kavli Prizes, uh, the presidential awardees for STEM teaching and STEM mentoring and early career achievement. President meets with all of them. I sometimes say that this is the most science savvy president since Thomas Jefferson, and the interesting thing is, of course, there's a lot more science to be savvy about today than there was when Thomas Jefferson was president. The budget challenge, the one at the top of my list, Huge boost for science and technology right at the beginning of the administration in the Recovery Act. A series of ambitious goals, uh, including making the research and experimentation tax credit permanent. We've never got that through the Congress, but we're going to keep trying as a way to encourage the private sector's contribution to the national R&D portfolio. And uh, the overall goal of helping to lift the sum of public and private investment in R&D to more than 3% of GDP. It has never been that high in this country. It got close in the height of the space race. It got to 2.9% uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we'd like to get it over three. The 2010 budget that the president produced put us on track to meet those goals. FY 2011 would have continued the trend, but we ran into uh, a barrier. Uh, setbacks because of the Budget Control Act uh, spending caps and ultimately sequestration. But despite the setbacks, science and technology have fared better 
in the 2011 to 2015 appropriations than most other sectors. We have not done as well as we wanted in support for science and technology, but I think we've done better than anyone could have expected uh, under the circumstances. This slide shows the budget figures, the actual appropriations for FY14 and 15, the President's FY16 budget proposal to the Congress, and the changes. Uh, again, the President continues to step up with all the flexibility at his disposal, which is limited, but he tends to use all of the flexibility at his disposal to plus up science, technology, and innovation. Some highlights of that FY16 budget proposal. Uh, DOE uh, up 7.3 percent, NSF up 5.2, NOAA and NIST up by very large amounts, uh, USGS uh, making up for, uh, for some flat budgets over a period of time significantly boosted. Some of the cross-cutting initiatives uh, also significantly boosted, including very significantly the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which would be up 9.1 percent if we can get the Congress to appropriate the money. Turning to the energy climate challenge, the second one on my list, uh, the Recovery Act had $80 billion for clean and efficient energy in it. We funded the Advanced Research Projects Agency for the first time, six new energy innovation hubs, again, public, private, academic, national laboratory partnerships. The first ever combined fuel economy and CO2 tailpipe standards for light duty vehicles, fuel economy standards for trucks, reinvigoration of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, sustained budget increases for clean energy and energy efficiency R&D, and a quadrennial technology review 2011 and 2015, and a quadrennial energy review providing an overall blueprint and strategy for addressing our energy challenges. And of course the Climate Action Plan, which the President rolled out in June 2013, and which is uh, proceeding apace right up to this moment, and I'll say a little more about that now. President's Climate Action Plan has three pillars. One is cutting carbon pollution in America, which includes cutting carbon dioxide emissions from power plants, promoting renewable and other cleaner energy options, fuel economy standards, cutting energy waste, reducing emissions of contributors besides CO2 to global climate change, and managing forests for carbon sequestration. The second element is preparing the United States for the impacts of climate change that we can no longer avoid, directing agencies to support climate resilient investment, establishing a national task force on climate preparedness, state, local, and tribal leaders, creating, and that's not mentioned here, an interagency council, which I co-chair with the director of OMB, the head of CEQ, and the assistant to the president for Homeland Security on climate change preparedness and resilience. It has already spawned five working groups that are working apace to deliver on improving the preparations of this country for the impacts of climate change, and of course, mobilizing science and data for climate resilience, and the third element, leading international efforts on global climate change, both bilateral and multilateral, and mobilizing finance for clean energy and preparedness. The most conspicuous achievement in this dom domain to date was the agreement that President Obama and President Xi announced in Beijing last November, where China and the United States announced their targets for greenhouse gas emissions reductions post-2020. And uh, particularly in the case of China, although both sets of targets were ambitious, this was the first time China had ever committed officially to peak and then begin to decline uh, after a particular point in time, namely around 2030. Action on the NASA challenge. The NASA that President Obama inherited was dominated by a human exploration program called Constellation, which was hopelessly behind schedule and over budget. It was uh, draining resources away from most of NASA's other missions, imperiling all of them. What we did, uh, ultimately, in cooperation with the Congress, was rebalance the nation's space policy, slimming down and retargeting Constellation, emphasizing visits to a near-Earth asteroid and Mars, promoting commercial crew and cargo, that is, a model in which the private sector takes the main responsibility for carrying people and cargo to low Earth orbit, 
extending the operation of the International Space Station, in which the world has an investment in the range of $100 billion, extending that operation to get more of the scientific and technology testbed value out of that, and restoring support for the previously neglected and imperiled programs. This is the first docking of a commercial uh, cargo capsule with the International Space Station on May 2012. This was the SpaceX Corporation's Dragon capsule. The amount of science that's been done in NASA under President Obama has been enormously uh, impressive. Uh, $30 billion for cutting-edge science uh, during the period of his administration. A mission to Jupiter, the fourth rover landing on Mars, 14 planetary missions, 19 missions to study the sun and its effects on the Earth, 21 astrophysics missions, five Earth science missions in fiscal year 14, the search for exoplanets that could support life, continuing with a new mission in 2017, and the James Webb Space Telescope, 100 times more powerful than the Hubble, back on track uh, to launch in 2018. Uh, and this is one of my favorite pictures, Curiosity on the Martian Surface, a self-portrait. The STEM education challenge, building an all-hands-on-deck effort that includes business, nonprofits, and foundations. The Educate to Innovate initiative the president launched in 2009 now has over a billion dollars in business and philanthropic commitments toward improving STEM education at the K-12 through level. We have extensively deployed the president's personal passion for the STEM fields and for STEM education with, as already mentioned, the White House science fairs and more. We have institutionalized cross-agency efforts in STEM education, a STEM education five-year strategic plan produced under the National Science and Technology Council. We have focused most recently on inclusion of underrepresented groups working with the White House Council on Women and Girls, the Domestic Policy Council, the My Brother's Keeper Initiative, and various minority-serving institutions to increase inspiration, preparation, opportunity, and support. On the partnership opportunity more broadly, Startup America launched in 2011, bolstering entrepreneurship. Jumpstart Our Business Startup, signed in spring 2012, crowdfunding, expanding many public offerings, an IPO on-ramp. DOE's Energy Innovation Hubs, already mentioned, linking national labs, universities, and industry. The Wireless Innovation and Infrastructure Initiative aimed at connecting 98% of the U.S. population with 4G wireless. That goal has now been achieved. The Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, which links research universities, high-tech companies, and the federal government, investing in emerging technologies of a wide variety of kinds to create high-quality manufacturing jobs, reinforced by the National Robotics Initiative and the Materials Genome Initiative. NSF's Innovation Corps, getting scientists out of the lab to start new companies. Action on the biomedical opportunity. Combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria, a big deal, starting with a PCAS report on that topic, leading to an executive order and a strategic plan in 2014. Just last week, a new national action plan to implement the goals of the strategy, aiming to slow the emergence and spread of resistant bacteria, to strengthen the national One Health surveillance operation, to expand research on diagnostics, antibiotics, new therapeutics, and vaccines, and accelerate their implementation, improving international collaboration in all these domains. The President's FY16 budget proposes doubling support for antibiotic resistance research and management to 1.2 billion a year. Another biomedicine initiative, the Precision Medicine Initiative, approach to medical care that uses big data to account for individuals' characteristics in treatment of cancer, uh, an effort to build a national cohort of a million volunteers whose health records, genome sequences, microbiome profiles, and other relevant data will be analyzed, 130 million in the FY16 budget. Uh, changing reimbursement policies to reinforce value rather than volume, $5 million for that in the FY16 budget, and looking at regulation to make sure our regulations in this space enable innovation while protecting public safety, $10 million for that in the FY16 budget. Another element of the biomedical uh, tranche of initiatives is the BRAIN initiative, brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies, 
This is uh, slated to go to $300 million a year in the uh, FY16 budget. It is part of a much, much wider neuroscience effort in the federal government, which is funded in the range of $6 billion per year. On the tech for government opportunity, presidential innovation fellows, nobody ever thought of this before, but we are bringing in cohorts of high-tech superstars to work in Washington, to work in the government in teams on information technology linked innovation challenges. Data.gov, over 100,000 government data sets now made available in machine readable and searchable form in support of innovation and entrepreneurship. Developing a data-driven culture in government getting key data savvy personnel ensconced across all of the departments and agencies. For the first time, dashboards online to monitor progress on major federal information technology investments. Um, continuing challenges, looking forward, what's going to be hard? Sustaining support for science and technology under the budget constraints that we face is going to continue to be hard. And some of the things that are going to be particularly hard are listed here. Uh, NSF support for basic research, absolutely crucial, under attack from some quarters. NSF support for social science, absolutely crucial, and in the national interest, under attack from some quarters. NASA Earth observation, particularly under attack from people who do not want to know what's happening on the surface of the planet because it might have policy implications they don't like. Uh, finding adequate support for advanced technology at NASA, I sometimes call this putting the science back into rocket science. Uh, has been a heavy lift. A number of other things here which I won't detail, but uh, they are areas where it is going to be demanding uh, to get the Congress to appropriate the necessary support. Uh, funding at NIH is generally less contentious politically. The Congress is always interested in cures for the diseases that afflict members of Congress, but it is still hard to increase NIH funding in percentage terms because it's already so big, about $31 billion a year. Implementing the President's climate policy is going to be hard in the face of congressional challenges to executive actions and the unwillingness of the Congress to provide legislative alternatives. Uh, we're going to continue to have big challenges addressing systemic weaknesses in STEM education, including weak teacher competence in the STEM fields at the K-12 through level, and inertia with respect to adopting more effective teaching methods at the college level. We're going to have continuing challenges in getting the key messages across to the public. Why science and engineering matter to the economy, to health, to environment, to security. How science works and why climate change and evolution are not mere matters of opinion. So let me turn to the role of the academic community in U.S. science and technology policy. And I'll do this in the standard uh, dimensions of academic engagement in teaching uh, a bunch of things uh, that are being done and should be done even more, deploying evidence-based improvements in how STEM courses are taught at the undergraduate level, getting undergraduates into research labs to inspire them early about the excitement of science and engineering, exposing STEM students and postdocs to science, technology, and policy issues, and to the option of K-12 through STEM teaching careers, Engaging in public-private academic philanthropic partnerships to inspire, engage, recruit, and support more kids in STEM. And creating opportunity and pursuing inclusion and support for young women and girls and for minorities historically underrepresented in STEM. In research, obviously, the universities must continue to recruit and support the people to provide the facilities and to sustain the policies that have made universities the mainstay of U.S. basic and early stage applied research. Make room for interdisciplinary and policy relevant research as additions to the university's portfolio, not to replace the important disciplinary focuses but to add to them. Providing STEM PhD students and postdocs with an introduction to how you translate discovery into application in society. And partnering with business where appropriate to leverage resources and exploit science and technology advances for societal gain. In public service, the third role of universities, encourage and support faculty forays into science, technology, and policy positions in government via sabbaticals, interagency personnel agreements, fellowships, 
and exploit the experiences of the returnees when they come back in classes, seminars, and symposia to interest others on the campuses in science, technology, and policy. Create workshops and seminars for your congressional delegation to acquaint them with the relevance of science and technology, including your science and technology, to society's interests. Conduct adult education and public outreach activities aimed at improving the science and technology literacy of decision makers and the public. And advocate for science and technology and for sensible science and technology policies. Now let me finally turn briefly to the leadership of this great university in this domain. The undergraduate research opportunity program of this university is now more than 20 years old, engaging first and second year students in research. And within that rubric, their Changing Gears program has been connecting community college transfers with hands-on experience in this university's research projects. The university's Women in Science and Engineering program includes programs for grades six through 12 and for undergraduate and graduate women, aiming to increase the numbers and the success of women in STEM fields. The University of Michigan Business Engagement Center, building relationships between industry and your faculty and students. The Office of Technology Transfer, which has been successfully facilitating commercialization of discoveries in this university's labs. The Lurie Nanofabrication Facility, an amazing facility which I have visited and seen how many small and medium-sized businesses are benefiting from access to nano fabrication technology and diagnostic technology that they could never afford to buy uh, for themselves. And of course, the University of Michigan is one of the founding partners of the American Lightweight Materials Manufacturing Institute based in Detroit, part of the Obama-launched National Network for Manufacturing Innovation. The university's Mobility Transformation Center, a public and private R&D partnership on improving mobility for people and freight. And I'll mention just a few University of Michigan faculty who are exploiting the opportunities available for universities to serve in government and then return to their universities. Betsy Stevenson, a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. By the way, she is amazing. Uh, I see her every morning in the 8.30 meeting of the President's Senior Advisors. She is a powerhouse. Uh, Stephen Crowley, with whom I've also worked uh, closely, general counsel now at the Department of Energy, previously in the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, Rosina Bierbaum, I mentioned, uh, former OSTP Associate Director for Environment and Acting Director of OSTP, now member of President Obama's PCAST. Francine LaFontaine, uh, from uh, the Ross School, serving as director of the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and these are just currently serving University of Michigan faculty. There's a much longer list, but I'm running out of time that I could show you of past faculty and graduates of this university in large numbers serving in key positions in the administration. So thank you, Wolverines, and thanks to all of you. During the course of this administration, electricity generated by wind has more than tripled. Electricity generated from the sun has more than tentupled. Uh, of course, they started from relatively small bases, but they are becoming a more and more important part of our energy portfolio. We are also working, of course, in non-electric renewable spaces, including trying to get biofuels from uh, sustainable means, including uh, from algae. Uh, enormous efforts and advances under this administration and in the private sector in battery technology, which is going to uh, enable us to cope more effectively with the intermittency of some of the renewable sources. If you look at the budgets uh, for renewable energy as well as energy efficiency under this administration, uh, they have been very robust and uh, with a little help from Congress, they will continue to be. Gil, Gil, you could have gone all morning without mentioning that uh, particular, <laughs> particular debacle. Uh, I, I, I would have to say we, we learned a lot from it. Uh, I think what happened with the rollout of healthcare.gov is everybody thought somebody else was, uh, was watching over it and making sure that it was ready. There was a lot of political pressure to do it on time, but of course it's always more important to do it right than to do it on a particular schedule. And it was not done right initially. The team that was brought in to fix it, uh, Todd Park, 
uh, and Jeff Zients. Uh, Todd Park was the chief technology officer at the time. He had not had oversight of this operation. Uh, we now know he probably should have. But he assembled a high-tech team drawing very heavily on Silicon Valley, many of whom have proven willing to stay in government. Uh, we now have Mikey Dickerson leading the Office of Digital Services. He was one of the people who led the repair of healthcare.gov under Todd Park. Todd Park, who has been succeeded as Chief Technology Officer by Megan Smith, formerly a Vice President at Google, and a high-tech uh, superstar. Todd Park remains uh, an advisor to the White House. It was Todd Park's invention to have presidential innovation fellows, folks who come in for periods of six to 12 months to work uh, in teams across the government. Uh, they have been amazing in addressing problems of uh, efficiency, effectiveness, coordination, where information technology can help. Uh, in terms of how we're interacting between the White House and the departments and agencies, the departments and agencies have gotten religion in this space. They are welcoming the recruitment of uh, highly tech-savvy people from the private sector into all of the departments and agencies to work with the CTO, the CIO, and the chief data scientist on making sure that we extract the potential of these technologies and the kinds of insights about applying them that have been developed in the private sector and that the government very much needs to make it more effective, more accessible to the population, more useful to everybody. Well, th this is an easy one because Dr. Bierbaum is gonna talk about PCAS later in the program. I don't wanna steal uh, too much of her thunder, uh, but it is a fabulous operation. It's about the most interesting committee I've ever been on. Uh, it meets uh, f together for two days every other month and has a one-hour conference call in the odd months, but more importantly, perhaps, it spawns multiple panels and working groups to conduct the studies that the president asks it to conduct, and those uh, work at a very high pace, and they also reach out into the wider community to bring in uh, additional expertise. But I'll leave the rest of that answer to uh, Dr. Bierbaum's presentation. I would characterize it as fabulous. I think it is unbelievable how much interaction there is uh, with the private sector in this administration on advanced manufacturing, on jobs and competitiveness, on information technology, on precision medicine. We have engagement from pharma, we have engagement from manufacturing, we have engagement uh, from the companies that are engaged uh, in space technology. Um, I can hardly imagine that there has ever been an administration with so many key figures uh, from the private sector coming regularly uh, in, and, in and out of the government. Um, we have a strong private sector representation on PCAST. On PCAST, uh, we have, for example, am I gonna steal your thunder on this too? Or are you gonna go into? Uh, Michael McQuaid, who's the Senior Vice President for Technology at United Technologies. We have Maxine Savitz, who is a leader in the private sector and ended up as a vice president of the National Academy of Engineering. We have Eric Schmidt, the executive chairman of Google. We have Craig Mundy, who was until very recently number two at uh, Microsoft. Uh, and their connections across the corporate community are mobilized along with those of many other folks in the administration. To, to make sure the private sector is well represented. Penny Pritzker, the Secretary of Commerce, amazingly well connected, of course, across the private sector. And uh, the extent to which the private sector has stepped up in these uh, STEM domains is uh, a commentary on their understanding of a couple of fundamental notions. One is that the pipeline of the STEM education system is not producing sufficient flow of adequately trained people to fill the jobs across industry that are available. Even in the recent period of high unemployment that we experienced, there were hundreds of thousands of tech jobs going unfilled because of the deficiencies in the pipeline. The corporate sector has therefore found it in its interest to work very closely with us in strengthening that pipeline, including our work in inclusion. You know, when we fail to tap the female half of the population, when we fail to tap the African American community, the Hispanic community, for the talent that is there, we are missing out on a big chunk of the talent pool. We can fix that 
and the private sector has been extremely interested in working with us to fix it. Similarly, the private sector understands that if we can do better at translating discovery in university labs and national laboratories into products and services in the economy, they will benefit and they understand that by working with the government, we can get that done. It requires the insights and expertise from the private sector, requires the expertise and insights from the academic sector and the public sector, and they are very interested in working together uh, to get that done. So our next speaker is Rosina Bierbaum. I don't think I need to introduce her anymore. Uh, I think John have referenced her multiple times. So Rosina is a professor and dean emerita at the University of Michigan with appointments in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment and also School of Public Health. Her experience extends from climate science into foreign relations and international development. As John mentioned, she is a member of President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Rosina. I can't tell you uh, what a great honor it is to have both the president of our university and President Obama's science advisor be my warm-up acts. <laughs> it's very exciting to be here to talk to you today. Um, you already saw our smiling faces, PCAST, uh, but I'm going to talk a bit more about what we do. So PCAST, get the acronym right, the president just calls us his scientists, but it is the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and actually it's the oldest of several councils in the White House that the president has. Um, there have been advisors to the president on S&T since Franklin Delano Roosevelt, so since 1933, and the names of these boards have varied over time, but the purpose of each remains essentially the same, to inject science and technology advice to the president on difficult and important issues. And we're allowed to make policy recommendations, which I think Ralph Cicerone will point out is a difference with the National Academy of Sciences, uh, where they can't really make policy recommendations. So that uh, discussion is a very interesting part of our PCAST deliberations. So if you think about it, for 85 years, science and technology advice has been infiltrating uh, the government. And this kind of policy making in science and science for policy and policy for science is really sometimes a very fearsome task. But we are administered by Dr. Holdren's office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, with support from the Department of Energy. And as you heard, we meet officially for six two-day meetings a year. Um, we meet the president about every other time. But in truth, given all of our subgroups and the many, many reports we're working on, we're actually on the phone with each other at least once a week. Um, this particular PCAST, here's our earliest picture of PCAST, was this was taken on April 27th in 2009 in the National Academy of Sciences building. The president decided he wanted to speak to the entire academy and it was only three months into his administration. Um, he laid out goals at that very first talk, as John has expressed, for research funding and for STEM education. And all the PCAS members are members of one or another of the academies of science, of engineering, of medicine, or of the American Academy. And as John's already said, we represent many different walks of life. We represent industry, academia, 13 of us, I think, are professors. Um, we have government experience. Nine of us have served in previous presidential administrations in six different agencies um, or national labs. And three of us actually held Senate-confirmed positions. We represent the fields of astrophysics, physics, chemistry, computational science, ecology, plant biology, geology, nanotechnology, health sciences, and international security. And as Dr. Holdren said, we are free labor <laughs> to the administration. What topics do we work on? Well, first of all, of course, they have to be, as I said, science and technological issues of highest importance, covering security, welfare, health of the nation, generally spanning multiple agencies of the government, or where we need really independent thinking or additional expertise to help formulate wise science policy. So we go off and create subgroups of ourselves and quickly augment our PCAST with really deep expertise in the areas of concern. And we try to produce our reports quickly too. So we try to produce them within six to 12 months and to try to do mainly, as Dr. Holdren laid out, deal with the challenges and the opportunities. 
We've been um, very active in our volunteer role. We've produced 27 full-length reports, and we have another four in the works due out in the course of this year. We're hoping that all these reports can impact the administration while it's still in office. And, and all of our reports, you can see, are on big issues. And if you just look at the ones on the bottom, our ongoing ones on elder tech to try to keep people in their homes longer and more autonomous, or designing the cities of the future, or private sector adaptation to climate change, or the science of nutrition. Yeah, these are all easy topics, but they're all really important science policy topics. Okay, what happens to these reports? Well, they are all briefed, of course, to the president, to the relevant agencies, and they are all in the public domain. Many of our recommendations have made it into the budgets from 2011 right to the 2016 budgets, especially those related to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, energy, health IT, vaccines, and others such as our recommendations on climate change or on energy or on environmental issues are things that actually could be implemented within the executive authority of the president. So let me just give you a few examples, and we'll start with STEM. As Dr. Holdren said, it's really quite central to this administration and to the recommendations actually of all our PCAST reports. I would argue almost every report has a recommendation that filling that pipeline and keeping it full is very important. But you can see what the president said in September 2010, that if we're serious about building a stronger economy and making sure we succeed, we have to make sure every young person gets the best education possible so we cannot be outcompeted. Um, we produced two reports on STEM education. The first one was on K through 12 and it was called Prepare and Inspire. And this is the one that said, we need a lot more science teachers, a lot more STEM teachers, 100,000 in 10 years. And so that became kind of the mantra, 100K in 10. The second one was Engage to Excel, and this looked at the need for postgraduate skill sets in STEM, so that we need to both teach students differently and to retain STEM-interested students. And that's where we concluded the entire pipeline from K through gray needs some help. We definitely need more STEM-capable workers. And if you look at this chart, the size of the bar shows you by field how many workers will be needed in each of these. The light blue bars are just the replacements, and the dark blue parts of the bars are new talent needed. So for all you students watching out there, there will be one million more jobs needed in STEM by 2018. And you can see the three biggest bars there are social scientists, engineers, and computer scientists, big growth fields. What are the impacts of those STEM reports? Well, President set goals, the 100,000 more STEM teachers, a STEM master teacher corps, a million more STEM college graduates to meet those bar charts I showed you earlier. Uh, Congress has not particularly helped with these so far. There's been a master teacher bill introduced every one of the last three years. But meanwhile, NSF and the Department of Education are putting allocations towards these identified goals, and the private sector has really stepped up, as Dr. Holdren has said. And in fact, the last bullet there, just at the last science fair last week, 240 million more money was committed by the private sector to help with STEM ed. Um, science is really cool, you've already heard with this president, and uh, you saw a picture, or you heard about Astronomy Day on the West Lawn, and this is the science fair this past year. I remember him saying to us at PCAST early on, if I'm going to meet with the athletes, I'm also going to meet with the mathletes, and I think that really he does believe science is cool and you've heard five science fairs there already. We've also done reports on energy and environment, and I was central to these, so I'm gonna talk a bit about it. And you might have gathered by now um, that our covers aren't very exciting. PCAST is dignified and understated. <laughs> but let me talk about the findings. So the one on the left is sustaining environmental capital, protecting society and the environment. Honestly, the state of ecological data is really among the worst organized and available. And if you think about it, many of us, including me and my thesis, have our, our data in dusty notebooks, haven't even been digitized. And yet, if you think about the issues of ecological change, how important is it to have 
data and trends over a long time. And so we said you need to bring the information technology tools to all of science, but especially to ecological data. And this has been um, the government's response to it. Uh, we created Eco Informa, and I admit that might be the worst acronym ever, but it is Eco Informatics to improve decision making about the management of environmental capital. And you see on the bottom three different hubs that have been created for interactive data sets a biodiversity research resource hub, an ecosystem services resource hub, and a land cover dynamics resource hub. So it's happening, but additionally, Ecological data is important in understanding resilience to climate change, past, present, and future. And so a separate PCAST climate report reiterated the key role of getting usable data out there. And between what the Sustainable Environment Report said and the climate report said, the administration has responded with a nascent climate portal where lots of data sets can be found. And also we have an early climate toolkit to try to help different users figure out this, the vulnerability of their particular sector or area. And we're really welcoming public comments on that now because we intend to continue to improve it. Uh, the energy report was called Accelerating the Pace of Change in Energy Technologies. And that highlighted the need for an integrated energy policy. And we actually note it, there really isn't a national energy strategy. And so it called for two main things. And as John has already said, these happened. It called for first, the Department of Energy taking a really hard look at its research and development portfolio and to be sure that some of that and a significant portion of that was focused on near-term needs to make progress on climate change quickly. And so we said focus on maturity. That is something that can be demonstrated at commercial scale in 10 years. Focus on materiality. That is that there can be a 1% impact on primary energy in 20 years. And focus on market potential so that we can expect adoption by relevant markets, um, and so considering the economics and the policy. And so DOE did so and produced the report cover you see there, the Quadrennial Technology Review. When they looked hard at their portfolio, they realized that 73% of their R&D had been focused on stationary sources. And so they adjusted that to ramp up R&D in six areas depicted by the technologies in those six circles. So across the top, three, addition, three new or enhanced areas in the stationary source realm, clean electricity, modernizing the grid, and increasing building and energy efficiency. And then three across the bottom in transportation, alternate hydrocarbon fuels, electrifying the fleet, and increasing the efficiency, especially in heavy duty vehicles. And so if you kind of drew a circle um, that ran down the middle circles, you could say the left half was on supply and the right half on demand. And so I think this kind of rejiggering of R&D has proven uh, very useful. And the second report we called for the broader government review to come up with a national energy strategy and produce a quadrennial energy review is being um, completed, the first draft of this, under Dr. Holdren's purview, and it will be out uh, very soon. <laughs> so I wanted to say a few words about the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership because Michigan was very, very central to that. And in fact, I think the three reports that ultimately came out would not have been possible at all without the great work of Shrita Kodar, who's there in the Kodar, who's in the third row. So Shridhar, thank you for taking time and going to work at OSTP and getting all of this um, hard analysis partnership work done. Um, I think this really advanced, we, we actually started this conversation with the president, I think it was back in 2009, and we always throw out ideas about what might be most exciting to him. But when we said, what about advanced manufacturing, he just seized on that immediately and said, this is something that should be bipartisan. This is something we really need to do. So we set up a steering committee of uh, 12 manufacturing firms and six universities. And I think as most of you know, Mary Sue Coleman was one of the original six uh, presidents involved in this. And on the bottom of the slide, you can see in the six bullets down there uh, that there are already five manufacturing innovation institutes that have been set up. 
as Dr. Holdren mentioned, the University of Michigan is part of the Detroit lightweighting effort. And that last bullet, four institutes announced um, proposals are due for the flexible, flexible hybrid electronics, the integrated photonics, the clean energy manufacturing, and the revolutionary fibers and textiles. So all that uh, coming soon. As you can see, you know, this is just an enormous topic. You're, you're dealing with basic and applied research, technology maturation, manufacturing readiness, global models for technology development, trade barriers, taxes, educational challenges again, vocational training, apprenticeship programs, immigration policies. And so it's really no surprise that we had to really do this in a sequence and produce two, uh, the three reports in 2011, 2012, and then 2014. And, and this topic does resonate with the Congress. Um, we are ready have five of these in place. We'll soon be up to nine institutes out of the 15 planned. We actually hoped in our report that there would be 45 total, and we actually expect there could be 300 million in bipartisan monies in 2016. But meanwhile, we didn't wait for Congress, and the agencies, again, have been very supportive and have essentially repurposed monies to begin moving in this direction. And I think you all know the statistic that 700,000 new manufacturing jobs have um, been achieved over the last five years. And I also think this is probably the first and only PCAST report I know of that has actually come up with legislation. So that's pretty exciting. So I just want to um, summarize a few more impacts of PCAST reports at the very highest level, but to say that many, many of our recommendations have been embraced and built on by the president and are in his strategy. Um, visa reform for STEM graduates, it's in the president's immigration reform. Got to see what happens with Congress. Permanent R&D tax credits, hasn't happened yet. Um, but some things have, the acceleration of H1N1 vaccine production, the funding of flu uh, vaccine manufacturing. I already said the Advanced Manufacturing Initiative and Innovation Policy is really happening. John mentioned RPE, that's happening. We have three new energy innovation hubs, the Quadrennial Technology Review and the Quadrennial Energy Review are all happening. Three new agricultural research hubs uh, focusing on climate resilience are underway. Our PCAST reports on climate change encourage the president to think more about preparedness and resilience. He created a state, a tribal, and mayoral task force. Their recommendations are in, and the new interagency group that Dr. Holdren mentioned is now trying to implement those, and we're also creating a parallel effort with the private sector on adaptation needs. Uh, managing spectrum created a new thinking of spectrum as kind of a super highway, and it's unleashing a lot of innovation. Uh, the antibiotic resistance report, Dr. Holdren talked about what's happened to that. And of course, the STEM ed reports, we're moving forward on the master teachers, we're moving forward on the public-private partnerships, uh, and uh, moving forward on supporting the next generation of STEM leaders and keeping them in school. So PCAST has really been an intense and a fulfilling effort to advise science policy. We have a president and a science advisor who are dedicated to making the United States first in science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's been just an enormous pleasure and honor to work on the 27 reports in six years and have at least another four to come. But I honestly do feel it is the highest calling to serve the science policy enterprise in this country and to be a civic scientist if we are trained as scientists. And so I hope that many of the students will follow so that we can continue to solve the increasingly interconnected and complex problems facing society and leave the generations to come truly a better world. So thank you very much. Thank you.